Well, if you have your Bibles open to Acts chapter 16, we're going to continue in on our Acts series this morning, Acts 16. Uh, As you guys turn there, uh, it's been a while since I've had the opportunity to speak uh, here in main service. So if I haven't had the chance to meet you guys, my name is Trey Corey. I'm one of the pastors here at Southwood, and it is a joy to be with you guys this morning. Uh, You may not know this about uh, myself, but I am married way out of my league. My wife, Marcy, and I have uh, two kids, Uh, and this is a picture of our kids. Uh, Our kids are in the middle, and their cousins are on the outside. This was at Halloween. Uh, Caroline, the girl right there in the middle, is uh, a little bit, she's about six years old now, and then her little brother there, Colt, uh, is about three and a half. And one thing about our family, and a little bit of a picture here, it gives you a little glimpse Uh, It wasn't just Halloween for us, but our little boy Colt is in a major, major pirate phase, okay? Now, it's not just a Halloween moment. This really is for us an actual obsession. So right now, everything in his world, everything that he sees life through is seen through the lens of a pirate. Every flat surface is water. Every moving vehicle is a boat, and it's probably a pirate boat. Uh, Every bad guy, every enemy, every problem is something that has to do with Captain Hook, and he's got to save the day. And so this isn't just kind of a a hobby for him. This isn't just a phase for him. This has become kind of an identity for him as well, because really, if you were to see him in the hallway, his Sunday school teachers know this. If you say, hey, Colt, how's it going? He will more than likely correct you and tell you his name is Jake the Pirate. He doesn't go by Colt more often than not. He wants you to call him Jake. And not just Jake, but Jake the pirate. It's really kind of his identity. And in this phase for us, kind of this hobby, this obsession for him, one of the sweetest pieces of this whole phase for us has been that his older sister, Caroline, about once a week, will make a treasure map for him and help lead him on a treasure hunt. It's really precious. Uh, I will tell you guys, though, these weekly treasure maps, if you were to look at it, I will tell you, your response will be much like what mom and dad have responded for us. It's been, I have no idea what the treasure is or whether treasure is hidden, okay? And so as Colt looks at the map, really what this whole treasure hunt really honestly is, is an opportunity to consistently remind little brother that he's absolutely dependent on older sister who will lead him on the treasure hunt. And so that treasure hunt is filled with all kinds of detours. It's filled with all kinds of redirections. It's filled with all kinds of dead ends. And all along the way, it's an opportunity for them to connect because he is absolutely dependent on her to lead him. Now, what does that have to do this morning with Acts chapter 16 and where we're going to head? This morning, we're going to look at a passage in Acts chapter 16 in Paul's life. And what we're going to see from this story is that really walking with God, discerning the will of God, often feels a little bit like that treasure moment for our kids. Often trying to discern the will of God, trying to discern what God has called you and I to, his plan for our life often is filled with all kinds of dead ends, all kinds of detours, all kinds of redirections. And the question is, how do we see God in the midst of those moments and how do we respond? Acts 16 really is going to be one of those moments in the Apostle Paul's life that he's going to face a series of closed doors. And what's really fascinating in Acts chapter 16 is his response to those closed doors, because really for you and I, we're quite familiar with closed doors. Uh, We have all kinds of moments maybe in life where you felt like God maybe kind of led you into a cul-de-sac or led you into a dead end, and you've often wondered in the midst of a closed door, you've often wondered maybe, where is God? What is God doing? How is God leading me in and through this? What's happening? For you students, some of those closed doors look like a lot of different things. Maybe you are looking for an internship this summer, and maybe you're trying to graduate, you're hoping for the great unknown that is life after college, and you're just looking for a job. And in the midst of that process, maybe you're already experiencing closed doors. Maybe it's been a failed dating relationship for you. I remember I had a friend in college who asked out a girl, (laughs) I kid you not, she said, hands on her head, are you kidding me? (laughs) That's not just a closed door, that's a slammed door in the face and you don't recover very well, okay? Maybe it's not a failed relationship, maybe for you guys too, you were trying to register for classes recently and the very classes that you needed to get into to graduate next year or this spring and you can't find your way in them, closed doors. Maybe for us adults and families, maybe it's been a job setback or a job disappointment. Maybe it's been something in your marriage or something in the lives of your kids or the kids that you hope to have that's been a major disappointment for you. 
Maybe it's been something even uh, in terms of employment or family or even just a health thing, a health diagnosis that struck you beyond anything you intended or imagined, and it feels like a massively closed door. It steals opportunities. It steals a vision of the future that you had imagined. What do you do in those moments? I love Acts 16 because we're going to see one of these moments in the Apostle Paul's life and his response in that moment. While the circumstances are very familiar to us of closed doors, I'm going to argue that his response in the midst of these closed doors is going to be un, very unfamiliar to us. The Apostle Paul is going to respond in a way uh, we're going to see this morning in Acts 16 that's going to be really unique and really distinct that's going to have a lot, I think, to teach us. As we wrestle with the will of God in the midst of closed doors, that's Acts 16. Acts 16 is going to break up kind of like a three-act play. We're going to see three different acts this morning as we walk through this book, three different scenes. And the first scene really sets up nothing more like a divine maze. Let's pick it up in verse 4 as we kind of see this chapter unfold in this first scene, this first act, if you will, beginning in verse 4. Now, while they were passing through the cities, they were delivering the decrees which had been decided upon by the apostles and the elders who were in Jerusalem for them to observe. And so the churches were being strengthened in the faith and were increasing in number daily. Chapter 16, verses 4 and 5 open with all kinds of opportunity, all kinds of excitement, all kinds of possibility. And then verse 6 hits. And they passed through the Phrygian and the Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And after they came to Mysia, they were trying to go into Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. And passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. This first scene in Acts chapter 16, I think, sets up a lot like a divine maze. Paul is going to have a clear uh, and a good goal. He wants to share the gospel with people who have not heard it before. And so he's moving, and they've experienced all kinds of fruit, all kinds of incredible, fruitful responses to the gospel. And now he's moving through Asia, and we find in verse 6, it says, that he had been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. I want to kind of give you guys a map, really, of his journeys. We're going to pick up in, verse, in chapter 16, verse 1. We find that he's in Derby, uh, which is right directly north of the island of Cyprus. And then he's going to move up, moving kind of northwest through Antioch. And then he's going to move through this Phrygian Galatian region on his way all the way to Troas. And so as he's moving through, of course, he's wanting to open up and share the gospel. The text tells us that the Lord forbids it. The Lord, the Spirit did not permit it. It's route one and detour number one. This first roadblock, this first closed door was not because he had a wrong goal. It wasn't because he was wanting to do something that was poor or less than ideal. He's wanting to do a great thing. And yet God, for whatever reason, uh, forbids him from doing it. Verse 7, and after they came to Mysia, uh, which if you'll notice uh, is right above north of the word there, Asia. So as they come through Mysia, verse 7, they were trying to get into Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. <laughs> Route 2, he's trying to get into Bithynia. He wants to share the gospel there. He wants to reach the people there. And the Spirit of God does not permit him. Roadblock number 2, closed door number 2. Verse 8, passing, uh, and passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. And in Troas, on the far, further western seaboard of Asia, he's over there going to get a vision that's going to finally direct him to Macedonia. But before we get to that and what's going to unfold in Macedonia, what must this moment have felt like to Paul? He's on a journey through a series of locations, and opportunity after opportunity, the doors close on him. So you guys, uh, in the midst of a series of family vacations, one of the things I notice in different cities that we go to is they often have what they call family-friendly mazes. <laughs> they usually have some kind of cute and pithy title like an amazing maze, okay? Right. After about 30 minutes of being in this amazing maze, I typically have a few other descriptors, descriptive terms to describe the experience, and it's not amazing, <laughs> After I've gone in a circle eight different times, after I've hit dead end after dead end, and after I have a kid who's all excited as we jumped into it, who's now on the ground, who's just quit, and I have to la lag their dead weight on my shoulder in a maze that I can't find my way out of, I start to lose my patience just a wee bit. 
Meanwhile, my sweet wife is up on some platform who can see everything absolutely clearly and thinks it's just simple to find the exit. And it's not simple at all. <laughs> what I want to do is just quit. <laughs> What I want to do is just call out and scream out and, and basically stop and maybe have a kind of a paralysis by analysis of where in the world am I, where in the world am I going, and does it even matter anymore? <laughs> have you ever had those moments? Maybe they're not in a maze, but maybe more realistically they're in life. Where you're trying to pursue the Lord, you're trying to wrestle with what does God have for your life, where is he leading you, where is he wanting you to head, and you don't know. <laughs> And at times it feels like he circles you around, or at times it feels like he closes door after door after door, and the instinct is to stop. The instinct is to be discouraged, to be frustrated, to be disillusioned, to wonder and to scream out at God, what are you doing? Where are you leading me? What do you want from me? What do you do in those moments? What's really interesting to me is I think we're incredibly familiar with these kinds of circumstances that Paul hits in Acts 16, scene 1. But I think it's his response and the, and the general feel of this entire passage that is really, frankly, I think, very unique for us. Because really, Paul is going to have a response here that I think is very different than our own. In fact, as you walk through Acts chapter 16, these first 13 verses, there are 16 different verbs that have some sense of motion. First 13 verses of chapter 16, meaning more than one verb, a verse that all has the idea of motion and movement. That part of the Apostle Paul's response going into a closed door and exiting out of a closed door and moving on is that he's always on the move. He's still moving. He hasn't stopped. He hasn't quit. He hasn't thrown his hands up and he hasn't gotten into a paralysis by analysis wondering where in the world does he go and he doesn't just sit and wait. He just keeps moving. And I find that really, really interesting from Acts 16 because I think Paul's response here is a little bit different than our own, and there's a reason why. I think there's not just a what that's different than ours. I think there's a why that's different than ours. I think Paul looks at the will of God as he tries to discern the will of God, and he does something different with it than we typically do. There's two things that I see for many of us as we respond to the will of God, as we respond to closed doors, that it manifests itself in our lives that doesn't show up at all in the Apostle Paul's life, at least here at Acts 16. And those two things are passivity and anxiety. Two things that I don't see here from the Apostle Paul that I think show up all the time in our lives and their passivity and their anxiety. The Apostle Paul is moving as he comes into a closed door and he keeps moving on the backside of a closed door. But what passivity does is it causes us to stop before we make a decision. And what anxiety does is it causes us to stop after we made a decision and we worry about it. Passivity and anxiety neither show up in the Apostle Paul's life because for whatever reason here in Acts 16, I think he views the will of God in a profoundly different way than we do. Two different ways that I think we see that. The first is this. I think we see from Acts chapter 16 and Paul's example of this idea, his perspective that God's direction in our lives often comes after our decisions. That God's direction, God's will in our lives is often revealed after we make a decision. After he makes a decision, then God directs him. And it occurs after he makes a decision, after he's moved out in faith. But what passivity does is passivity causes us a paralysis by analysis that stops us dead in our tracks and we look for a five-year plan from God. For you college students, I'll tell you, uh, there's no characteristic that I see in your generation more than this issue in terms of passivity and your pursuit to discern the will of God. Maybe it's the incredible plethora of options and opportunities you have, and so it's like going to a restaurant with a menu that's all great, like Christopher's, and you wonder, what do I order? <laughs> but for some of you guys, one of the things I see over and over again in your generation is a kind of passivity, a kind of paralysis by analysis in which you will not make a decision because you're so afraid you're going to make the wrong decision. There's a passivity that locks you down that prevents you from moving forward, that prevents you from even beginning to get to see what the direction of God is because God's direction always comes and often comes after the decision. But passivity stops us dead in our tracks and we can't make a decision. We wait and we wait and we wait. 
incredible book a guy named Kevin DeYoung wrote called Just Do Something. I'm going to read you guys kind of a long quote from it. And everything in this book I don't necessarily agree with. There's some things that he's going to say about the sovereignty of God, the will of God, incredibly complex topics that I don't always agree with everything. But I will say for you college students, there's something in the book that he hits your generation square on. And here's one of the things he says to your generation that I think struggles with passivity. He says this, Expecting God to reveal some hidden will of direction is an invitation to disappointment and indecision. Trusting in God's will of decree is good. Following his will of desire is obedient, but waiting for God's will of direction is a mess. It's bad for your life, it's harmful to your sanctification, and it allows too many Christians to be passive tinkerers who strangely feel more spiritual the less they actually do. God is not a magic eight ball that we shake up and peer into whenever we have a decision to make. We know that God has a plan for our lives. We know that it's wonderful. The problem is we think it's going to, that he's going to tell us the wonderful plan before it unfolds. Passivity causes us to stop dead in our tracks, have a paralysis by analysis, waiting for God to write it in the clouds. Do you guys notice even in Acts 16, Paul eventually does get a clear, compelling vision. It's not written in the clouds. I don't know how God reveals it to him. But did you notice it comes after three previously closed doors? <laughs> he had to keep moving even to get to that place where it became absolutely clear. Because what we see over and over again is this idea that God's direction in our lives often comes after our decision. So for those of us that have a kind of passivity that we stop dead in our tracks, waiting for an answer from God before we take any kind of risk and we step out in faith, seems that Acts 16 is going to push us in an opposite direction, that we've got to move out in faith. But for some of us, it's not passivity that gets some of us, it's anxiety. For some of us, on the front end of a decision, we're so locked down, uh, not sure which decision to make, but for some of us, we do make the decision, and then we get locked down on the backside because we're so worried. Did I take the right job? Did I go on the right date? Did I choose the right major? Did I put my kids in the right school? Did I buy the right house in the right neighborhood? Did I make the right move at the right time? And we get locked down, not on the front end of making the decisions, but we get locked down on the back end. And what I love about Acts chapter 16 as we look at the Apostle Paul's life is this, that God's redirection often comes after our decision. Do you guys notice that from Acts 16? Paul is moving, God just tweaks it. Bumps him, sets him in a different course, then tweaks him again. And the entire time, God is helping kind of shepherd this guy to get him where God wants him to be. But for some of us that deal with anxiety, I think we view the, the will of God like a house of cards. One false move, one false puff of air, and the whole thing comes collapsing down. Or it's like a tightrope that we're walking down the center of, and one false step, and we're dead, Right? There's no like out of balance, it's just, it's over, like game over kind of deal. And we have this view of the sovereignty of God, we have this view of the will of God that it's like a tightrope or a house of cards that one false bad decision, one decision off the mark, and we're going to completely miss out on all that God has for the rest of our lives. (laughs) What Acts 16 tells us is the will of God works very differently than that. God takes Paul's decisions as Paul continues to stay on the move and he continues to move him and get him where he wants him to be. His will is robust enough to handle our own poor decisions or our own off-place decisions. He continues to redirect us and move us where he needs us to be. It's not that fragile. I think Acts 16, for some of us, as we think about our own passivity or we think about our own anxiety, it gives us a lot of freedom and a lot of encouragement to just chill out. Some of us, we just need to make a decision. And then for those of us that have made the decision, we need to just relax and trust that God will reveal, God will redirect if he needs to. And it's not that hard, especially if we just stay on the move. But when we lock down before decision or after decision, then it gets harder for God to redirect us. And so we've got to just stay on the move. And what Paul does, which is so different than us, is that he stays on the move. And this last quote from De Young, I love as well. This is what he says, moving from the passivity idea to the anxiety idea. Why are we so anxious at times? I think it may be that we're trusting or expecting something from God that he never promised. Notice what he says here. Put aside the passivity, which he's already addressed, and the quest for complete fulfillment, and the perfectionism, and the preoccupation with the future. 
That for some of us, why are we so anxious about decisions? Because we have an expectation that everything in our life has to work out perfectly. It has to be completely convenient. It has to be completely uh, without trial, without adversity, without difficulty. That's why we're so anxious. We're anxious and we're expecting something from the Lord that he never promised, which is why we're so preoccupied with the future because we want it to work out perfectly. We don't want difficulty. We don't want the very things that frankly cause us to grow and cause us to depend on the Lord and trust him and walk with him in sweeter ways. But if you're seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, you will be in God's will, so go out and do something. Hence the title of the book. So what's the point for us? Application one. When God closes doors, we have to walk by faith, casting off passivity and anxiety. When God closes doors, we have to continue to be in motion, walking by faith, casting off passivity and anxiety, because passivity and anxiety will be the very things that cause us to not continue to walk by faith. They stop us in our tracks. And because Paul continues to walk by faith, he's going to move into scene two, and he's going to see God do something. But for many of us, because of our passivity and anxiety, we never get to scene two. We get stuck in scene one. And we don't get to see, we don't get a front row seat to what God is about to do because Paul keeps moving, and he keeps walking by faith, and he's going to see God, in a sense, begin to open a series of doors. Scene one is the closing of a series of doors, like a divine maze. Scene two is nothing more than a Black Friday, all right? Doors are going to open. See what I did there? You like that? All right. That's what happens next. Notice verse 11. So putting out to sea from Troas, he ran a straight course to Samothrace, and on the day following to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia. You get that sense in verse 11. Verses 6 all the way to 10 feels like stop, start, stop, start, stop, start. Verse 11 just feels like now he's just moving. Ever been on the highway and you're stuck bumper to bumper in construction uh, or because of a wreck and it's just so unnerving and then all of a sudden you get to the end of the bottleneck and it just opens up and you just slam on the accelerator and you just take off because you feel like you're so free? That's verse 11, (laughs) okay? Paul's been stuck in bumper to bumper traffic, closed door after closed door, and finally it's going to open wide and he's just going to take off and he lands in Macedonia, which is Europe. And notice what happens. Not only do they get to Europe, uh, which the district of Macedonia, a Roman colony, and we were staying in the city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to a riverside where we were supposing that there would be a place of prayer, and we sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled. God had forbidden Paul from that point forward speaking the word in Asia because what God was wanting to do was to get Paul and his traveling companions to Europe for the first time ever. And the gospel lands in a new frontier. And not only does the door open up to a new landmass, but notice who the doors open up to as well, beginning in verse 14. A woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening, and the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household had been baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. Not only did the doors open to Europe, but the first conversion they get in Europe is a woman named Lydia, who is a seller of purple fabrics. She is like a corporate executive CEO. She comes to Christ, her family comes to Christ, and not only that, but then they open their home, and their home becomes a base of ministry operations for Paul and his people as they traveled into Europe for the first time ever. They land in a new frontier, and they get a conversion here right off the bat. It seems like like that. And then this woman and her family open their home so they can have a base of operations to figure out how they're going to reach Europe. (laughs) Amazing. Paul's ministry and outreach moves from the corporate executives all the way to the very other end of the socioeconomic spectrum. Notice verse 16. And it happened that as we were going to the place of prayer, a slave girl having a spirit of divination met us who was bringing her master's much profit by fortune telling. And following after Paul and us, she kept crying out saying, these men are bondservants of the most high God who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. She continued doing this for many days, but Paul was greatly annoyed and turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out of her that very moment. The moment we hit verse 11, we get open door after open door after open door. An open door into Europe, an open door with Lydia, an open door with this slave girl. 
All of a sudden, all the difficulty, all the herky-jerky, stop, start, dead end, redirection, and detours of scene one go away, and we get an array of open doors in scene two. It's interesting, though, because in this scene two, all these open doors will eventually lead to a closed door, because notice verse 19. And when her masters saw that her, their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas, and they dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. And when they had brought them to the chief magistrates, they said, these men are throwing our city into confusion, being Jews, and are proclaiming customs which is not lawful for us to accept or to observe being Romans. The very series of open doors in scene two end up culminating in a closed door in scene two as they're thrown into prison. It's interesting, scene one is all about closed doors because Paul and Silas can't get in. Scene two ends with a closed door and Paul and Silas can't get out. Scene one ends with a series of closed doors as Paul and Silas are locked out. Scene two ends with a series of closed doors in which they're going to be now locked in. But what does scene two teach us and Paul about those closed doors that they already saw in scene one? That when doors close on us, what scene two teaches us is even though we can't see it at the time, God is still on the move and he's still working even when those doors shut and he's moving us in the sovereignty of his will to what he intends for us. It's not a health and wealth deal because clearly doors open and then doors close again in scene two. This isn't always fun, but this is how God works. God is moving and he's working way before anything they could have imagined in scene one. And so doors open in scene two beyond anything they could have imagined, and then doors shut again. The irony of it is those open doors led to closed doors, and then we get into scene three, which is frankly nothing more than a rock concert, okay? Watch what happens in verse uh, 25. But about midnight, Paul and Silas, as they were in prison, they were praying and they were singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there came a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's chains were unfastened. Historically speaking, this is probably the first ever rock and roll concert in Europe. (laughs) The foundations are shaken. Doors are flung open. uh, Handcuffs fall, fall off. In the midst of this closed door, God moves in ways that Paul could not have ever have imagined. And by the time that Acts chapter 16 ends, what we're going to see is that the very jailer of their prison house who almost drew a sword to kill himself and Paul and them stop him, he comes to faith, his whole household comes to faith, and they're going to be baptized by the end of Acts chapter 16 in this last scene. In the midst of the closed doors of scene one, What God ends up doing in scene two and scene three is opening doors in some of the most unlikeliest of places. One, Europe. Two, amongst women. Three, amongst slaves. And four, amongst Gentiles. But it was the closed doors of scene one that set the stage for those open doors of scenes two and scene three. And unless Paul had stayed on the move, he would have missed out on being a part of and seeing those things. Passivity and anxiety did not stop him in his tracks. He continued to move forward in faith, trusting that God was on the move. So when God closes doors, it's imperative that we continue to be in motion, walking by faith, expecting that God is on the move. That when those doors close around us, when those valleys come, when those disappointments come and those setbacks come, that feel like a limiter of our future or a limiter of our opportunity, Scenes two and scenes three teach us that God is still on the move even when we can't see it. Isn't that the beauty of the gospel too? Isn't that the beauty of what we see at the cross? As our Savior Jesus is crucified on a cross is the very epitome of a closed door. The disciples who put their entire hopes on this guy and his future reign and his future kingdom see it all go flushing down a toilet and a closed door that was unlike anything they could have ever thought about that broke their hearts, that disappointed them and crushed them. But they couldn't have imagined, even though he told them, (laughs) that three days later he would resurrect and that he would return and he'd be there in their very presence. That that closed door led to an open door that they could never have imagined, that there's always a delay. There's always a lag of time as you move from closed door to open door. And the question is, how do you respond in that lag of time? It's not a question as to whether God will close doors or whether he will open doors. The question is, how do you respond in between that time? 
Let me give you guys a few questions to ponder as you pull away this afternoon, as you think through Acts chapter 16. The first is this. What are the closed doors that are in your life right now? What are those disappointments? What are those discouragements? What are those places where God took away an opportunity seemingly or you feel like you got led into a cul-de-sac or you saw a door close after door close after door close? What are those for you this week, this month, or this semester? Second of all, in the midst of those closed doors, do you find yourself experiencing passivity or anxiety? Which tendency do you fall on? (laughs) Do you fall on the passivity that you can't make a decision to move forward? Or do you fall on the uh, side of anxiety where you shut down on the back end wondering if you made the right decision? You made it. You move forward and then you kind of shut down. Which end of the spectrum do you fall? And then lastly, in the midst of that passivity and anxiety, how can you walk by faith trusting that God is still on the move this week? In the midst of that lag time between the closed doors that you're experiencing and the open doors that he may have down the road, They may look very different than anything that you thought he was going to do or that you would have chosen or that you would have written. In between those doors, the ones closing and the ones opening, how do you respond? How can you believe, how can you act on this week that he is still on the move? Even when you can't see it, even when you can't prove it, and even when everything in you just feels disappointed and discouraged, how do you continue to stay in motion? How do you continue to walk by faith? I think the gospel is a wonderful picture of that. At the highest of levels, I think Acts 16 shows us in the Apostle Paul's life, this is how God moves. That his direction in our lives often comes after our decisions, and his sovereignty and his will is robust enough to redirect us as well after our decisions. It's not a house of cards. My hope and my prayer for you guys this morning would be that looking at Acts 16 would bring some freedom, (laughs) that it would bring some encouragement That if it happens for Paul, it's okay if it happens for us. But it would also challenge us. That we would see something in the motion and the faithfulness of Paul to continue to move forward that would challenge us and would call us forward. What does it look like like for you this week to continue to move forward in wherever closed door that you're finding, whatever closed door that you're looking at? Let me pray for us. Father, I thank you for your marvelous grace in our lives. Thank you for our Savior, Jesus Christ, who would give his only life, his body, his blood for us so that we could have a relationship with him. In the midst of talking about decision-making and your will and your plan for our lives, I thank you that the greatest decision we could ever make is to trust your Savior for his death, burial, and resurrection for the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. And if there are some of us here this morning that have never made that decision, Lord, I pray that you would help us to make that decision trusting that our lives are built upon the foundation of Jesus Christ, that our hope is in him. There is no hope in any decision-making process or any plan of life apart from him, and I pray you would help us to find our hope in him. Even in the midst of the waves of life, even in the midst of the discouragements and the setbacks and the trials, when the waves seem higher than we can even see over, I thank you that you hold the waves, that you hold life, that our hope is firmly set and firmly built upon you. In the midst of those moments, in the midst of those roadblocks and setbacks, Lord, I pray that you would create in us a willingness to move near you, to reach closer, and to walk more intimately with you, trusting that you have a plan, trusting that you have a purpose, trusting that you're going to continue to move us forward, that you have something down the road for us. Well, probably a little different than we imagined, but it's good, and that you're going to move, and you're going to work, and you're going to do more than we could ever think or imagine. Lord, we ask for these things this morning. Through your Son and by your Spirit, we pray. Amen.